Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon, USA area. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is we have decided to talk about. And this evening, my guest for the umpteenth time is Dr. Martin Donahoe. Hi, Don. It's always a pleasure to have Likewise. you. Likewise. He's been on so many times I've lost count because he's so darn good at what he says and what he does and how he is. And he's such a delight in my viewers. always like what you do. And I've checked the viewings of your shows, and it, it's pretty high. Oh. So you're not going to disappoint me tonight. You're going to still boost my ratings, aren't you? I hope so. <laughs> my agent hopes so. <laughs> How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, yeah. And tonight we'll be talking about Doctors Gone Bad, Research, Torture, and Terrorism. And that's a mouthful. And the idea is a mouthful. And I was thinking, what is he going to talk about with a topic with that kind of a title? And then I looked at some of the material and the questions you sent me, and I thought, my gosh, I forgot. I always forget how expansive your thinking is and how thorough and complete your research is, and I always appreciate it very much. So since you've been on so many times, I'm, uh, it's too bad that some viewers haven't seen you before in your personal interview in depth, but too bad we'll say a few words about you personally to allow enough time for what you'll be talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, who, who, who is Martin? If your best friend, if I, if I were to ask your best friend, who is Martin Donahoe, what would your best friend say? Martin is what? Uh, hopefully the first thing that would come out is a, a devoted father. I'm a single and sole parent of a two-year, eight-month-old daughter who is um, just an absolute delight. And I, I tell you, I've never been happier in my life. And uh, Are we going to have her on the show tonight? I think so. She's been on a few times. So um, <laughs> I, I, I'll bring her back, and then one day she'll look at these and see the progression of how she's aged over time. Yeah. So good. And uh, when, where were you born? In the San Fernando Valley, Southern California. Southern California, and a re religious preference. Uh, you can comment about that or not? No, that's, that's just a, a, a very complicated question that begs a, a somewhat complicated answer. But in, in brief, uh, brought up Catholic, uh, attend Unitarian there, services a lot, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, consider myself um, uh, having Christian leanings, but like to incorporate into my faith many elements of Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and I'd say in a nutshell, I have a lot more questions than I have answers, but I, I'm always seeking. That's important. And you're an MD. Anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> and you're still working? I am. I practice medicine part-time uh, in the hospital mm -hmm. at Kaiser, and I teach periodically. More recently, it's been going around the country giving lectures here and there at different medical schools. I do some work with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility mm -hmm. and uh, activist work on a number of projects related mostly to environmental health and food safety. I've looked at some of the stuff that you've been doing through the years, and it just boggles me. You must be 13 people, you know that. <laughs> no, um, uh, I wish I was 13 years old again. Yeah. But I also, and this is just a plug for my website, which you'll see, Sure. Uh, which is where I have the bulk of my material, all my lectures, all my slideshows, and in fact, the slideshow covering tonight's uh, discussion will be up on there. And it's publichealthandsocialjustice.org. If you want to find the easy way there, it's just phsj.org. Mm -hmm. All my academic papers are there. Uh, all the appearances I've had with you are up there. And um, also, if you want to buy my book of the same title, you can find out how to do that there. Don't worry, I'm not making any money off of this book. Uh, for for um, texts like these, one does not uh, go into it expecting to make If money. I were to decide to read everything that's on your website, how many hours or days would it take to, uh, to read, read it all? Uh, weeks. 
<laughs> I thought, I thought so. Right, and I update it, it every it six to nine months, so it's it's a labor of love, but it really takes me about 10 to 15, sometimes hours a week to keep all the slideshows updated. My gosh. When do you ever sleep? Not enough. <laughs> uh, I try to time my naps with, with my daughters so that we're... Um, in sync mm -hmm. and I've been very fortunate because she's kind of been on a night schedule like me I'm a bit of a night owl mm -hmm. so that's going to change when she starts what will be pre preschool in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> but for now we uh, we try to hang out as much as possible and do the usual, usual Portland activities and uh, I have um, my mom who's very involved and um, helps take care of Maddie and I have two fantastic nannies um, who are just godsend. So I, I really lucked out. Um, but tell me now, the last two times you uh, talked about it, you didn't have a, 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 a wife or a maid or somebody, and you're available. You're still available, or you're about uh, to? I am. Your... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been racking my brain trying to find someone that's appropriate for yeah, you. Yeah, I'd like to find a partner slash wife uh, for someday and, and mother to Madeline. Um, uh -huh. I'm trying. I'm on the dating websites, uh, it's, uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. Will you say something about your political persuasion? Are you a, a Trump, Trump fighter, or <laughs> Bernie? <-ite> or what? <laughs> no, I voted for Bernie and I, I consider myself a Green Party member since almost all of their platform yeah. basically resonates with the beliefs that I have. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very disturbed by, by Trump and uh, I can't even keep track of what he says day to day because the the no one, one outrage just takes the place of another but to have such a misanthropic uh, misogynistic xenophobic uh, ignorant scientifically uh, vacuous knuckle-walking troglodyte running for office um, <laughs> and, and getting people to clearly vote against their own personal interests um, the vast majority of those who do favor his candidacy boggles my mind um, we'll see where that goes. I, I guess I'm going to be coming back to talk about the election in a month or so. Yeah, there are some people who are professionals who got together and decided that they would give a diagnosis in Axis 3, the Trump of a narcissism, narcissism. Oh, textbook. Any medical student could tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just absolute textbook. <laughs> okay. Political persuasion, we always just talked about that. And uh, memberships in the political, social, or civic organizations, there's a thousand of those. <laughs> those that will have me. <laughs> I think no, I mentioned yeah. those, yeah. 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 How about a few people from the past or alive today that you particularly admire or look up to? Any uh, my parents. Your parents. If it wasn't for them and their devoted self sacrifice for so many years. Uh, I wouldn't be where I was. My brothers, um, they um, have also been an inspiration. They are both married very well, and I adore their wives, and I've got three nephews and a niece um, that I love dearly. I'd say outside of the family, people like Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, um, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, Elizabeth Warren I admire greatly. There's, there's, uh, there's so many. You're going to fall off the left side of your chair in a moment. Yeah, oh, that's, that's, uh, that happens all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's, we hardly use any time in the bio segment, so let's start in the main body of the report. And then uh, in about 15 minutes or so, we'll take a break anyhow. Sure. And bring Maddie on. Can I call her Maddie? Sure. What's her real name? Oh, Madeline, Maddie, the professor, Bugs, Chops, <laughs> Mrs. Chops, Hey You, uh, all of the above. All of the above. Yeah. All right. Let's just skip right over to Doctors Gone Bad, Research, Torture, and Terrorism. Why did you choose a title like that? That's pretty comprehensive. Why? Uh, I have an interest in medical history, and when I was first... Entering the field of medicine, um, I s developed this great appreciation for the fact that doctors are granted by society access to the most intimate details and moments of people's lives, and mm -hmm. thus are granted tremendous power for good. And when doctors go bad, uh, they can do tremendous evil. 
And I was a research scientist at the time, so I started to look into the history of human subject experimentation and then found out not only about the atrocities that the Nazis and the Japanese committed in World War II, mm -hmm. but those that were committed by our own government in the 1940s, 1950s, and beyond. And even how many of the lessons that one would have thought we'd have learned uh, decades ago. America create, uh, created atrocities, committed atrocities. Yes, are, are still being perpetrated today. today. So I thought what might be worthwhile today is to talk a little bit about that history. Sure. Then talk about some contemporary issues and mention doctors who are notorious murderers, terrorists, despots, and heads of state but also talk a little bit about doctors going bad in other ways that are um, especially pernicious and not always recognizable, and how we can change that, how we can um, improve medical education and the selection process for physicians and the ongoing training and education of physicians so that they don't fall off the boat entirely and give in to, um, to, to evil. And it's, it's very easy for people to do that, as we know from Milgram's classic experiments and other experiments, that um, especially with groupthink, it's very easy for doctors to capitulate to the demands of their government or those who are somehow in charge of them. So, Are you going to talk about a few people who are good guys? And I am. Yeah. I am. Yeah. But I'm going to name a lot of bad guys. And I guess it's probably worth starting with the Nazi atrocities. And these really grew out of the social Darwinist movement in the United States and Great Britain. More physicians joined the Nazi party, or a greater percentage of physicians joined well, say, the Nazi party. Say a few words about social Darwinism sure. for those of us who don't well, know. Well, Darwinism in a biological sense is translated often as survival of the fittest. Yes. And that does not mean who is necessarily the most muscular or fit or athletic. Um, what that means is those who are able to reproduce and whose progeny then are able to reproduce are considered fit in, in the biological lexicon. Mm -hmm. But that got translated into those who should survive and make a society stronger are those who are more fit because of their athleticism or their skin color or their wealth mm. uh, or their socioeconomic so status. And that's social fit. Darwinism. Oh, yes, it's, okay. it's, it's a perversion of Darwin's biological theory. Sure. Oh, so a lot of that went on in Germany and Japan. Anything more you want to say about what went on there? Oh, there's, there's quite a bit to say. The, the German physicians, as I mentioned, joined the Nazi party at a higher rate than any other profession at the time. There were 52,000 people who were members of the party. And the atrocities began in subtle ways with things like involuntary euthanasias, sterilizations. There were 70,000 involuntary euthanasias, 370,000 sterilizations, and then, of course, six million plus people killed in the genocide of the Holocaust. Um, we, as a country, are not immune from those atrocities either because 70,000 sterilizations were carried out in the United States over the 20th century. Why were that, that high number of Germans uh, uh a lot of it had to do with pressure from various medical associations and from academia. And um, Jewish doctors dropped dramatically as a percentage of physicians as the National Socialist Party rose. And so those who wanted to take the place, get better academic postings, get higher salaries, get better jobs, were happy to jump in, but had to pledge allegiance to the Nazi ideology. I see. And the ones who really became the worst are um, people like uh, Wegener, Reiter, Mengele, Eppinger, um, Hallivorden. Many of these people are associated today with their names being on diseases. Wegener's granulomatosis, mm -hmm. Reiter's syndrome, which is now known as reactive arthritis. What happened to the Jewish um, physicians at, 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 during that uh, period? Many of them died. Many of them left the country. Uh, and um, it really, today even, the number of Jewish physicians in Germany is quite small. They never really, really? regained their ranks, which were, were quite high prior to uh, the Nazi party coming in. 
-hmm. And the, the, uh, the experiments that were carried out were really quite atrocious. They involved things like vivisection of live individuals, so surgery without anesthesia, uh, deliberate infections, irradiation of testicles, uh, injection of gasoline in order to try to find out better methods of execution, heteroplastic transplantations, um, and those could be interspecies transplantation, an arm from one species to a human or is from one individual to another. Is this curiosity as to why this is going on? Is scientific experimentation for what reason? Most of it was frankly torture. Um, for instance, Eppinger, the, the father of modern hepatology, carried out a study on water deprivation where the prisoners were literally drinking from the toilets. They were so ill from this and dying from this. Oh um, so God. much of it was purely torture, but there was a rationale for some of it. For instance, there were some hypothermia experiments carried out where they immersed uh, prisoners in ice water and, and at, at one point were cutting out beating hearts from the prisoners as they lived um, to do vivisections to find out exactly what would happen with exposure to very cold water. And the rationale was our soldiers might be um, out in the snow and suffer from severe hypothermia and we know, need to know how to treat them. Or our airmen might be uh, shot down in the North Sea and we need to know what happens if they're drinking salt water only and, and they become severely hypernatremic. Their sodium level goes very high. So there was a scientific rationale behind a lot of this, but much of it was to improve the efficiency of the Nazi killing machine so that Torture. more people could be killed as the quickly as possible. There's something in, in humans, human beings, certain certain human beings who uh, torture just for the sake of the joy or pleasure of torture? Why is that? Uh, I wish I could explain that. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine that someone having raised a child basically from coming out of, of the uterus into my hands um, to where she is now, it's hard for me to imagine that any baby is born purely evil. Uh, I think some of it has got to be brain damage of some kind, upbringing and um, trauma that they have experienced themselves, for instance, on uh, um, a, a l more mundane or less serious level, we know that people who are bullied as children are more likely to become bullies themselves. Sure. Uh, people who are abused are it's more nurture likely to rather than abusers. nature. Huh? Right. There may be an element of nature, there may be an inherent mental illness, or as I said, some brain damage or drug use or something that leads to that. Um, I, I would hate to think, though, that there is something inherent in the human brain, although there might be from an evolutionary standpoint of having to survive and, and basically eat or be eaten, um, and that we've been able to suppress with our frontal lobes, but that does uh, allow us to act in ways that are inhumane. Uh, it's, it's, our, it's our job as individuals and as societies to try to basically tamp that down as much as possible and not let it take over. Oh, boy. Discuss U.S. research abuses from World War II to the present. Well, I want to mention the Japanese because the, the, the story is quite interesting there. They're, um, the uh, physicians who were involved were led by Shiro Ishii, uh, who was a prominent uh, physician, scientist, investigator. They got about 10,000 doctors involved in these experiments that were also horrific, things like centrifuging people while they were alive, detonating bombs that would blow off limbs and then deliberately infecting them with anthrax, plague, TV, TB, other organisms. Mm -hmm. Again, much of what might be thought of as torture, but another way to evaluate um, responses to different treatments uh, uh, for infectious diseases that could be used as bioweapons, things like anthrax and botulism and typhus. It's hard to believe that these kinds of things went on for so many years. Well, they, they did. Now, the outcome is rather interesting because following the war, there were the Nuremberg doctors' trials. Uh, 23 doctors were put on trial, 16 were convicted, um, 7 were executed. Um, Interestingly, though, none of the Japanese ever faced justice. Why, and why is that? The reason for that is the U.S. basically brought them over to start our biological weapons program at Fort Detrick. So not only were they granted immunity from prosecution after the war as part of the, the settlement and the surrender of Japan, they were even paid money to share their knowledge and to come over and start our own bioweapons program at Fort Detrick. So it was a very different response. Now, uh, German scientists who worked in the rocketry program 
were brought to the U.S. under Operation Very Paperclip, Brown, Brown, right, yeah. and granted immunity from prosecution also. But for some reason, the German doctors were prosecuted. The Japanese doctors were not, um, and instead, many of them came here. Um, however, a number of them later in life, and we're talking decades after World War II, served in prominent positions, including things like the Japanese equivalent of the National Institutes for Health, uh, the Green Cross, heads of departments in medical schools. Um, and so they basically escaped any sort of retribution uh, or punishment for what they did. Oh, man. What about the Tuskegee syphilis study? Well, Tuskegee is interesting, and, and it shows how we in the United States were not immune to our own abuses. So the Tuskegee syphilis study began in the early 1930s. Uh, the thought at the time was that the natural history of syphilis, which goes through three stages, a primary stage, which is a chancre, a secondary stage where you can feel systemically ill, and then a third stage or tertiary syphilis, which is much more serious, which can uh, cause aortic aneurysms to burst and can cause dementia, among many other things. It takes years for that it to develop. It takes years for that to develop, but it can be prevented early on with treatment. And the thought was that African Americans are different, and so the natural history of syphilis is different in them because of their skin color. Uh, and then ideas of blacks being hypersexual and spreading disease to white women. And so we need to study syphilis in blacks. Now by the mid-1940s, it was widely acknowledged that penicillin was an effective treatment for syphilis at all three stages. And yet this study that involved 400 individuals continued under the auspices of the U.S. Public Health Service, which is a branch of the federal government, mm -hmm. through 1972, when a reporter got wind of it and the study was stopped, and we ended up uh, basically paying uh, those victims who were still alive. The last one has, has subsequently died. In 1997, President Clinton formally apologized on behalf of the U.S. government. Um, but it's been estimated that about 40 partners of the untreated patients uh -huh. uh, contracted syphilis as a result, and that 18 babies were born with congenital syphilis. And congenital syphilis basically uh -huh. causes irreversible brain damage. Yes. And so um, what's particularly fascinating about this is that after the Nuremberg trials, the Nuremberg conventions came out, which basically codified laws related to human subject experimentation, saying that you had to have the absolute consent of the subject, uh, that there was to be no unnecessary physical or mental suffering, that there was an obligation to terminate the study if things were going wrong, or you found that a treatment was causing harm in particular. And it also led to the Geneva Conventions, and I just want to read um, uh, a couple of lines from the Geneva Convention, mm -hmm. uh, which again came right out after the Nuremberg trials. And there were a number of Geneva Conventions uh, over time, but these are the ones that I'll address. I will not permit considerations of religion, race, party politics, or social standing to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will not use my medical knowledge contrary to the, no the laws of humanity. It is unethical for physicians to employ scientific knowledge to imperil health or destroy life. So somehow we didn't, we didn't get the memo on that. Who put the, those things together? Uh, these, were, these were international agreements. Mm -hmm. um, and there's multiple Geneva Conventions covering a number of laws of warfare. But these were ones that came out after Nuremberg. Now, um, it's interesting because the man who was the uh, head or the research coordinator of the Tuskegee study, uh, I want to read a quote from him, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two, basically. Um, but the first one, uh, was um, John Heller, uh, and he said in 1976, granted, when he was asked later about the study, the men's status did not warrant ethical debate. They were subjects, not patients. Clinical material, not sick people. Now, wow. after he left uh, his position at the Public Health Service, the person who took over after him was the one who had conducted the Guatemala STD studies, and should I go into those? Yes, yes, I've heard just a tiny bit about that. Yeah, this is another dark spot on U.S. research. These uh, were some studies that were carried out in the 1940s in Guatemala, where the U.S. government deliberately infected soldiers, prostitutes, 
orphans, uh, mentally ill patients, uh, and others with syphilis and gonorrhea. Now they treated the vast majority of them, but they lost track of about 13%. They didn't do any contact tracing to find out who they, whom they might have slept with and passed the disease on to. Um, boggles the mind, but it was basically to test different treatments for STDs. Um, Were you on antidepressants during this stage of your research? Yeah, this oh is hard stuff. To, it's, it's hard stuff to deal with. It's very hard stuff to talk about. And, and in some sense, I feel like I almost have to talk quickly through this because if I sit and contemplate the, the horrors of what was done and the innocent victims, it's, it's literally mind boggling. Um, it's like trying to imagine yourself at ground zero as a nuclear weapon erupts or at one mile out and two miles out and three miles out, which we've talked about on another show, what the, the, the consequences yeah. are to your body of that. It, it's almost over, overwhelming. Um, but the person who took over that study after that was Dr. John Cutler. Um, and he ran the Guatemala STD study for a few years. Um, in the mid-1960s, he went on to be an interim dean at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, here's an a infamous quote from him. Unless the law winks occasionally, you have no progress in medicine. Oh, these are our leaders. So, yeah, and, and it, it, it's quite disturbing. Mm, mm. Major ethical issues surrounding human subject experimentation today. Is any of that going on today? I think about the, oh, maybe 30 or so years ago when they discovered by accident that they were spraying a, a flu virus in the Bay Area. That was serratia, which is a bacterium which can cause uh, pneumonia in ventilated patients, usually in patients who are immunosuppressed in the hospital. What year was that? Do you remember? That was in the 1950s, and that was around the time that the um, uh, Edgewood Arsenal experiments were going on through the U.S. Army, where they were deliberately infecting soldiers with a variety of biological uh, warfare agents, and around the time of the MK Ultra program run by the CIA, where they were injecting people with LSD and doing sensory deprivation forms of torture and so on. Um, so uh, things continued. Uh, in fact, they continued through uh, the year I was born, 1963. So in 1963, a man named Chester Southam at a uh, Jewish hospital for the chronic diseases in New York deliberately injected cancer cells into human beings without their consent. Uh, now the rationale was there might be an immune response. We can then take serum from those patients, inject it into patients who actually have cancer, and it'll evoke an immune reaction against the malignancy. Um, is there any evidence that anything like that is going on today? Well, n not to that Sponsored degree. Sponsored by our government? N no, uh, at least as far as I know. Um, and I don't want to sound like a sort of tinfoil paranoid, but the government has been involved in things that are quite disturbing. For instance, torture um, in extraordinary renditions run by the CIA during the ongoing war against terror. And basically that was outsourced to uh, two psychologists uh, who were paid a million dollars each and their firm was paid $81 million to basically design and implement various forms of torture, which of course is, is uh, opposed by all the major medical organizations. So we are still doing it, America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to be sure and end up with some good positive. I am. I think we have a little more to say about of course. What, what's happened until today, but I think it, it does get kind of interesting because the abuses today are more subtle, less recognized, but for those that suffer, that the suffering is no less enormous for many of them. I wonder if it's time to take a little break now and have uh, our other guests show up. <laughs> <laughs> Should we bring her in right now? Or? Shall we take a break first? And during okay. the break, she just appeared out there, so let's take a break now. My boss. And have uh, the uh, mics off, and then we can bring her in, okay? Okay, great.
Thank you, sweetie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and this is our secret guest again for the third or fourth or fifth time. Look, look over there, sweetie. It's Maddie. And oh, now over there, I think over there. Can you say hi? You're on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy? <laughs> you want to have grandma come on? Yeah, mom, come on. So this is my daughter, Madeline. Uh -huh. uh, this is my mom, Annette, grandma extraordinaire. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> oh, she sees herself. <laughs> what what happened to your hand, sweetheart? Oh, I scraped it and fell. Oh no! Does it hurt? You're a pretty strong, kid, huh? It hurts. Does it, it was hurt? Just, it was just oh. an uh -huh. abrasion, right? Uh huh. Yeah, little abrasion. Where, where <laughs> are we going to go? Where are we going to go for dinner tonight? I can't even say that word. It's James. Do you like it there? Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to order? I'm going to order some chicken and some lemonade and some peas. And some peas? Do you like the peas? Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. Do you want to have a drink of Daddy's water? <laughs> okay. I make a funny sound when I drink. I know you do. So Daddy's got to talk about some pretty, pretty depressing stuff for the television now. So... Um, you're the light of my life, sweetheart, and um, I will see you when we're done here, okay? Okay, thank you, Daddy. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, we had a little accident. It happens. That was my fault. I shouldn't have given it to Manny. <laughs> it's okay, Bugs. Look at, the, look at the awesome patterns it makes, though, huh? Isn't that awesome interesting? Awesome patterns. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you get going. Thanks, Mom. All right, Bugs. You be good. I can bring some more towels. I love you. Yeah. I think well, I'm happy just doing this if you want. Is that okay? Will that work? Yeah. Okay. I'm, can you read these books again? Yeah, but not now, <laughs> sweetheart. Hey, Mom. We'll be okay. <laughs> you got to go, Bugs. Can you go to Grandma? I don't, I don't, know, where, go. I don't know where she went. Hey, Ma? <laughs> She's gone. Yeah, we got to keep going. All right. Can you, yeah, can you take Maddie, please? Okay, I'm done. Okay, thanks. Oh, Daddy. Okay. See you later. Sorry about that, Don. No problem, Mo. That's, uh, that's how it is. That's, yeah, that's, that's my life, yeah. West, yeah. Um, and where were we on our next questions here? You had, from memory, yeah. A few more that you wanted to talk about, examples of doctors going bad. Yeah, just a few to bring us up to the present day. Okay. Uh, there was a man named Henry Beecher, who's an anesthesiologist at Harvard, and in uh, the mid-1960s he wrote a seminal article where he described some of the major abuses that had taken place over the last 10 to 15 years in research, all of which were published in major medical journals. And so we're talking things like injection of live cancer cells, deliberate non-treatment of patients with strep who could go on to develop rheumatologic problems and kidney problems, um, manipulation of organs under anesthesia without patient consent. Um, intriguingly, when all the actual studies were identified, which was not till about 1991, and there wasn't much of a public outcry. Many of the people who had conducted those studies were still in academia. Some had passed away. It was sort of just forgotten about. Um, and the other one that's well known is the Willowbrook hepatitis study, which uh, I don't know if you've heard of that. No. Willowbrook was a, a home for developmentally disabled and other children on Staten Island. Yes, I think I... Yeah, so what one. they did is they had basically endemic hepatitis A. And so they wanted to find out a little bit more about the transmission of hepatitis A and how immune globulin might prevent it. But rather than test kids who already were infected with hep A from being there, um, they deliberately fed um, half of the newly admitted kids cereal with centrifuge stool uh, that was dried and pelleted that had hepatitis A virus in it. And then there was a control group who got centrifuge stool. When out. did this happen? This is in the 1960s. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in okay. 1966. Oh. So, um, so that kind of brings us through the present day. Um, there, was, there was a lot going on in the 1970s. You may not have known this, but through the 1970s, 90% of research studies conducted by industry were conducted among prisoners. 
And then a few pharmaceutical executives were caught talking and saying that they were cheaper to use than chimpanzees, and that caused a public outcry. And sort of the number of prisoners in research dropped off to zero at one point, but, but now is very, very small. So this is what we know. So based on what we know has happened in the last century or so, we can, I can imagine that there's still some stuff going on in addition to waterboarding mm -hmm. and the other sorts of crimes that went on that were like waterboarding or in that uh, right. category. Right, and doctor involvement in torture um, occurs in a number of different ways. The doctors can help design the methods of torture. They can be present to basically clear the patient for more torture to say he's okay and keep going. They can falsify medical records and death certificates. Um, since the mid-1970s, there have been 85 physicians in 16 countries who have been convicted of torture. But um, as I said, the psychologists, non-physicians, but the psychologists who ran the CIA's program basically were given a legal grant of immunity from prosecution too by the government. Mm -hmm. So it's unclear if anything other than the opprobrium of their colleagues that they'll ever have to face. So torture may be defined according to the administration in Washington, D.C. at any time, right? Depending on who's right. leading the country. Right, and, and, and the fact is, though, it doesn't work. Um, it wastes a lot of time. It leads to false confessions and a lot of time and money spent uh, running down bad leads. Um, there are other ways of interrogation uh, that can allow for mutual gain that are much more likely to gather actionable intelligence. There are some people who take the opposite position than you're taking right now. Well, they, that they're position that is it not, does work. But it's not supported by the evidence, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a scientist, I have to go with the scientific evidence, um, as well as the, 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 the opinions of people that, that, while I may not agree with them politically, I respect for their service to this country and what they went through. People like John McCain, who was tortured. Mm -hmm. Who knows that torture does not work? Yeah. Um, and who has bravely spoken out against torture. I won't go any further into politics, but there are certain people in, in politics right now who I would okay with uh, torture and those kinds of behaviors so, because they say it works. Well, they say a lot of things too, like the, the planet isn't warming up and... Um, well, it isn't, is it? <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's unfortunate when science doesn't drive policy and it really is dark days for science when in many ways we're living in a demon-haunted world of, of superstition and ignorance and sometimes merely just greater corporate or government interests that have um, willfully manipulated data to either make money or get votes or uh, marginalize certain segments of the population. Mm -hmm. Terrorism. Uh, is that successful terrorism or not? Well, if by um, successful... What is, what is terrorism? Yeah, I, I think terrorism is, is basically um, violent or even nonviolent acts that are designed to scare an entire population um, and that uh, almost always attack innocent victims. Um, they can be carried out by individual lone wolf terrorists or by organizations that are, that are terrorist groups. Um, and they're designed not only to psychologically traumatize a population, but to deplete their financial resources um, in, in fighting terrorism. I mean, imagine just the, the, the hundreds of billions, the trillions of dollars that have been spent, and I'm not talking about the wars, just on security measures since 9-11. So if anything, one might argue that in the back of bin Laden and his second in command, Al-Zawahiri, Al who by the way was a physician, Mm -hmm. um, in the back of their mind must have been, not only will we kill a lot of people, we'll bring down these iconic structures, uh, but we'll also financially deplete the resources of the United States because the way that we suspect that they'll react is such that uh, they may end up entering a war that will be unpopular. They may, and, and basically we'll just, we'll, we can bankrupt them. 
Uh, I'm not saying for sure that that, that was their thinking. Um, they were madmen, but uh, it, it certainly does cost a lot of money. There are some infamous examples, and I, 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 I want to read these. These are actual physicians who, who um, were and are terrorists uh, today. And there have also been some who are mass murderers. Um, the world's most notorious serial killer, um, Harold Shipman, was a general practitioner in England who killed 400 people. Um, <laughs> and gosh. so, uh, but in terms of actual uh, terrorists, the, uh, George Habash was a pediatrician. He was the man who founded the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which was behind the Black September hijackings. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Fatih Shikaki was the founder of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, al-Qaeda we mentioned. Um, Mehmet Rezid was an Ottoman physician and middle manager who was um, partly responsible for the Armenian slaughter and helped develop the Butcher's Brigade. And this is a quote from him, those Armenian bandits were a bunch of harmful microbes pestering the body of this nation. A doctor's duty is to kill microbes. So this sort of depersonalization that takes place among torturers and terrorists who are physicians, but often with reference to sort of biological mechanisms of disease control. And, and, and uh, let's see, South African cardiologist Wouter Basson, also known as Dr. Death, who ran Project Coast in the 1980s, which was a military program looking at uh, chemical and germ warfare, poisonings, kidnappings, and even plots to sterilize South Africa's black population. So this sounds like Google on steroids. Uh, Ikuo Hayashi, um, he was the chief of circulatory medicine at a leading Japanese hospital. He was also the guy who pleaded guilty to planting sarin gas on the Tokyo subway. Um, and then the, the most recent ones, you probably heard of Radovan Karadzic, uh, who was convicted by the International Criminal Tribu Tribunal for War Crimes against um, Bosnian Croats and Muslims. And then Bashar al-Assad, uh, the Syrian president who's an ophthalmologist who trained in the UK. Uh, and in the war that he has been conducting uh, against his own people, almost half a million people have died. It's led to refugee crises. He's bombed hospitals. He's used sarin gas against his own people. Um, the question, or, or chemical warfare, I should say, against his own people. So the question is, um, are there other people like this lurking and how, how do we stop this from happening? How do we? Well, um, the first thing is I think ethical codes of conduct for research. Um, okay. Those have become fortified over the last few decades with required ethical research training for investigators in medical schools and PhD programs. And part of this even arose out of some of the studies that have taken place in the last few decades, like placebo-controlled trials of anti-HIV drugs for pregnant HIV-infected mothers to prevent transmission to their offspring. Um, studies of uh, placebo control versus a, a surfactant to prevent respiratory disease of the newborn, respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn, which was going to be carried out in Brazil under the aegis of Johnson & Johnson, but Public Citizens Health Research Group caught wind of it and basically stopped it. But uh, this is an example of, of U.S. researchers going into the developing world using human subjects there to do things they might not be able to get away with in this country, um, and uh, often conducting placebo-controlled trials where half the group doesn't get what would be the standard of care in the United States. And th these are the so-called parachute researchers uh, that go in, conduct a study that will be mostly beneficial to U.S. patients mm -hmm. um, who can afford it because of the, the pharmaceutical industry's egregious excessive pricing of drugs here and in the developing world. And they take the results that they gain in the developing world and bring them back for U.S. patients. So one, one way to stop it is, is, is ethical codes of conduct and ethical training for investigators. However, that's not going to stop everybody. Um, I think it has to go back to the focus of how we choose medical students um, and how we nurture them. How we choose medical students or mm -hmm. how do we choose medical students to read out those kinds of potential Torturers. It's tough uh, because um, you can have them take surveys and personality tests, which are subject to social desirability bias. 
Um, you can look at their background and training. I think that's always helpful. Those who have been involved in some sort of humanitarian work or perhaps those who are Renaissance individuals who've studied literature, history, philosophy, um, and are well-rounded. Those who have a background in, in ethics of some kind. I think that would be a good way to select them, not just someone who's gotten straight A's in chemistry or biology. Um, I think we have to watch what happens to them during medical school, because that's a dif difficult time. And who are going to be the overseers? Well, uh, their mentors um, and their teachers, and ideally their colleagues and the nurses they're with and their patients. Um, but uh, as students go through medical training now, it's known that, that many of their humanistic tendencies and their empathetic tendencies that they enter school with deteriorate dramatically by year three and by year four and then on into internship and residency. Um, and they um, lose touch with the reasons why they went into medicine. And I think that medical training needs to focus much more on nurturing that feeling of why we all wanted to be doctors in the first place, um, of nurturing respect for patients. Um, but I think it needs to basically change its focus back to what it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And that was? That was a much greater focus on public health and attention to the social, the cultural, the economic, the environmental, the racial contributors to health and illness. Because frankly, those cause much more morbidity and mortality than the diseases that we see or I see as an internist where the, by the time I've seen a patient, there's not Frankly, and I hate to say this because it sounds cynical, but there's not much that I do that makes a huge difference, at least in terms of medications and other things. Now, if I, I'm seeing patients who are hospitalized for end-stage disease, um, but even the medicines we use for um, prevention of things like heart attacks and to treat high cholesterol and so on um, are, are not nearly as effective as attacking the social contributors to, to health and to disease would be. And I can give you some examples if, if, yes, if you want. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one area would be looking at environmental degradation and the number of deaths due to climate change to air pollution. Another would be the status of women and their social and political and legal and educational marginalization. So today, women uh, do two thirds of the world's work, both paid and unpaid. They uh, sit in 20% of the legislative seats of governing bodies. They uh, earn 10% of the world's income, and they own 1% of the world's land. Are you talking about world, world worldwide, worldwide figures? Worldwide, but still in the United States, women are making 75 to 77 cents on the dollar. That mm -hmm. hasn't changed since the 1970s. Um, and so something needs to be done, and I think a lot of it has to do with early childhood education in the developing world, access to uh, the full complement of reproductive um, uh, medications, policies, term pregnancy termination, family planning, and so on. Um, but in the United States, uh, we need to, to change policies both at the institutional and business level and at the governmental level and get more women running for office. Um, and so so that's another area that we could attack. Another would be um, simply looking at, and I'm, I want to give you some statistics because th these are some of the most important studies I think I, I've read. If, if, if you were to go to the year 2000, mm -hmm. and this is all published, all these studies are on, on my website in this slideshow for this talk. Um, the number of deaths attributable that year to low education, a quarter of a million, racial segregation, 175,000, uh, poverty, 135,000, income inequality, 120,000. Now, then we could say, well, how many are due to heart attacks? Well, 193,000. So almost on the same level as racial segregation. Um, uh, lung cancer, 156,000. Uh, and a fantastic study, this was, again, from the American Journal of Public Health. The investigators in 2004 looked at the preceding decade, and they asked, all right, what are what is the number of, of deaths that have been averted over this period by every single medical advance? New pharmaceuticals in the United States, new pharmaceuticals, new surgical techniques, new vaccinations, et cetera. 
and they came up with about 175,000 deaths averted through all scientific research over the preceding 10 years. Mm -hmm. Then they asked, well, how many deaths would have been averted had we simply equalized the mortality rates of blacks and whites? 686,000 deaths. So not to disparage the research enterprise, which is of course extremely important, but it's, it's easy to see how we, we can do this. We can decrease morbidity and mortality, in this case, between the, the differences between the races, just through social policy. Just a couple more examples. Mm -hmm. If our ha country had an income gap, like many of the Western European nations, with their stronger social safety nets, we would avert about eight to 900,000 deaths per year. Uh, it, it's just, it's extraordinary. Um, education associated mortality. If we were to um, have a public education program that was equal and available to everybody and was of high quality, then between 1996 and 2002, we would have averted 1.3 million deaths because the better educated you are, the longer you live. All medical advances, again, 175,000. Okay, I'm aware of the time. We've got so, about three minutes or so, three or four minutes left, and I'm wondering if we can talk about uh, some doctors that you're aware of nowadays who are just the opposite of the doctors going bad. How about some doctors going good? Yeah, there are some great examples of that. And in fact, um, uh, I'll give you just one from World War II. Um, there were two Polish doctors that basically concocted a fake typhus epidemic in a little village um, because they wanted the Nazi soldiers to be afraid to come in and catch typhus. And so <laughs> they used an inoculum of a, a, of a, a typhus that really wasn't able to cause much in the way of harm. They had some fake patients set up. The Nazis just bypassed that city. So the number of lives saved there just by two physicians. This is really documented. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The Dutch physicians um, almost uniformly rejected the Nazi ideology. They were holdouts from the Nazi ideology as the Nazis made their march across Why Europe. is that? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think a lot of it is group unity, the, the sort of 100th hundred, hundred monkey effect, seeing your colleagues doing it, seeing your neighbors do, doing it, maybe a, a longer tradition of um, independence, maybe just hatred for the Nazis, uh, maybe uh, greater empathy, maybe their prior government, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but they were able to do it. So it's possible for people to resist. The sense of social justice? Mm -hmm. People who are doing the good work today, many of these are doctors who are working with Doctors Without Borders, which is a fantastic group that goes into the war zones and, and whose hospitals and clinics have even been bombed. Um, and see, these are people who, unlike me, are actually on the front lines risking their lives. Um, people with partners in health, Paul Farmer and Jim Kim's group, um, that, that is working in a number of countries throughout the world. Um, people like Steve Miles at University of Minnesota, who has basically made it uh, one of his lifelong missions to document physicians who torture throughout the world. What is it about Cuba, for all these years, has provided medical help around the world. It's one of their primary uh, successes, uh, wonderful things we can say about the Cuban Revolution, the amount of doctors and medical people they provided around the world. What is it about that revolution? Well, it's extraordinary. And of course, there have been a number of abuses uh, under the Castro government having to do with freedom of speech and people being locked up for their ideologies and so on. But in terms of the healthcare system itself, um, there's a great attention to public and neighborhood health. So um, health healthcare is basically a house-to-house -house sort of basis, an emphasis on prevention, on clean water, on social stability and social cohesion, on um, providing vaccinations at an early age. Um, and, and going for uniform vaccination, and providing cheaper pharmaceuticals, free how, access to medical care. How do you get social stability? Well, part of that is through having a totalitarian government, but what I meant by social stability is more um, neighbors looking out for each other. Um, neighbors, basically, who are aware if the elderly person three doors down is sick. Mm -hmm. Frankly, uh, if you were to ask the average American, to, uh, if anyone on their block had a serious illness like cancer, most of them would probably have no idea. And yet probably on the average block in the United States, there's people suffering from end-stage heart disease, cancer, HIV, and other illnesses. We're just not as connected as a society. And that lack of social support um, 
basically leads to earlier death. And it's one of the reasons we have such bad health outcomes in this country. What do you think about this, the Cuban Revolution? Good or bad or positive or negative? Or? The, 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 the current sort of quasi-revolution that's going on or the revolution that took place under Castro? From the time of Batista to the present time overall. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I could cherry pick out good things like the health care. Generally. Um, but ge no, generally, I think, I think any society that has to subjugate its, its individuals and, and deny them the fundamental right of freedom of speech and freedom of con congregating with other like-minded individuals to, say, practice their religions or to speak out, I, I, I have problems with that government. Um, I'm, and, and that's not to excuse the U.S. government. Finally, which is, we've got a point of contention. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> you go. I'm not a historian, but you, I'm you go. I'm talking about the end result and how those people have been, as you table about the collapse, I don't even remember that, yeah. And uh, what they've done around the world mm -hmm. with uh, people, medical people, people helping other people. Right, involved. they have exported physicians to, yeah. to Is many that American important countries. enough to consider a, a primary importance? I think it's very important, but... but a primary importance? Uh, no, I don't think it, I don't think it negates other things. We better stop before they yell at yeah, me. This, um, so let's take a 30, 30 seconds or so sure. to talk to the, the people, the viewers out there about anything you want to say to them. Well, I, I, we've left out a lot of the more minor abuses of doctors gone bad, and hopefully we'll talk about those on another occasion, sort of um, fealty to corporations and secrecy of research and having sex with patients and cheating and Medicare fraud and uh, other abuses. Um, but I, I think the thing today is we're all responsible for the quality of the doctors in this country. Um, if you're a patient, you're responsibility. You're responsible. If you're an educator, you're responsible. And um, if you're a nurse, you're responsible. We have to watch out for each other. Most of all, we have to create a more nurturing environment that's not filled with hate um, and hate speech and that, that incorporates not only a tolerance, but an appreciation and a love for the differences between the sexes, the races, the different sexual orientations. And only when we have that will we create a society where not only do we have good doctors, but we have good business people, we have good ministers, we have good teachers, and, and there's a lot we could do to that. But Will you say good night for Maddie because she isn't here now? I know, she's still away. <laughs> she's waiting for me because we're going out to dinner. Good night, Professor. I love you. <laughs> it's time to stop now. Let's have a couple of closing comments. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to thank you for watching. And remember KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC, kind, friendly, and charitable. And thank you, Dr. Donahoe and Martin, for coming out again. My pleasure, as always. Thank yeah, you again. Thanks.